but they're <laughs> yeah but but i'll do a more formal when kate gives me a cue because we to make sure everyone is able to get in and all that if she has anyone stuck which sometimes happens but um, people are coming in now as they would be if we were in a hall which would be a lovely thing to be doing We'll get started shortly, everyone. Welcome. Um, we know people from all over the place because, and everyone you're going to hear from nights from kind of all over the country too. So that, it's um, great to see everyone coming in. Toby, you must know Nicole Jervix. <laughs> I it turns out I do. Yeah. <laughs> just just a hunch. <laughs> I yeah. I we may have grown up in the same house. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you see all kinds of you know, there have been some surprises on these sometimes when people like, oh, so and so's here. I think we've got Jurevix locked up, at least in North America. So yeah, okay, well, that, yeah, <laughs> I'm probably related to them. So I have to say, I just noticed that my son is watching from Thailand. Oh, wow! Great. Wow! Nice. Well, this. That is that part where people are or not, you know, and he's he's in tomorrow already then. Yeah, exactly. Tomorrow morning. Oh, got the word. Let me see. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and begin, even as people do keep coming in from the near and the far, um, to say to everyone who's joining us from everywhere, um, including Thailand, as we've just learned, um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of everyone at the Elliott Bay Book Company, which is located on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle in the northwestern part of the United States. We are delighted and thrilled to have you joining us for this program uh, that's going to be um, taken up by various people involved in the extraordinary book um, and exhibit um, devoted to the work of Barry Lopez um, and Deborah Gortney. Um, this book um, has just come out uh, from here to the horizon. Photographs in honor of Barry Lopez is done in conjunction with a, an exhibit that's presently going on um, by that name at the Sheldon Museum of Art in at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And um, Kate, my colleague, who's doing all the heavy lifting on this, which she'll be putting links about um, the book, the exhibit, and more as as this program goes along. Um, the book, um, and you'll hear from the editor of the book, Tony Jervix, Toby Jervix, and Deborah Gwartney, and some of the photographers. This book, um, and Toby will say more of this, uh, but I, but I, but because um, books are involved, um, many of you know, uh, remember in 2006 when this um, amazing volume, Home Ground, first came out from Trinity University Press, um, a, a lexicon of, of of terms that Barry Lopez and Deborah Gwartney commissioned all sorts of writers to to do um, landscape features and. Um, and uh, which were which uh, that edition was illustrated by Molly O'Halloran. There was then um, a field guide edition, much different in shape and size, uh, but also something you could tote around when you actually are in the landscape and not um, not out um, and and outdoors somewhere. Um, and now this book, which um, and uh, Toby and Deborah and and then you'll get to hear from some of the photographers, which uh, takes in. Um, in the spirit of that book, which it takes um, places and landscape features and has drawn from photographs of 50 photographers um, are in the volume and in the exhibit. And tonight you'll hear five of them. 
And I will not say too much more, but to say that you will first hear from to Toby Jurovix, who is the now the founding director of the Barry Lopez Foundation uh, for Art and Environment at, um, and he's based in um, Santa Fe or outside Santa Fe now. Prior to that, um, has been a curator of photography at the Princeton University Art Museum at the Smithsonian. And prior to taking on this role with the Barry Lopez Foundation was at the Joslin um, Art Museum, which is a neighbor of the Sheldon um, in Omaha. And also very central to this, to the very notion of this book, is Deborah Gwartney, who is with us from Eugene um, and is uh, herself um, the author of two extraordinary memoirs, I Am a Stranger Here Myself, which was published at the same time as Barry's last the last book that um, saw Barry um, living to see it, uh, Barry's book Horizon, but Deborah's uh, memoir, I'm Stranger Here Myself, preceded by um, an earlier very strong memoir, uh, Live Through This. And um, as some of you will know, last summer, when Barry's posthumously published book, um, Embrace Fiercely the Burning World, was done, um, he... Um, there was a program like this online, which had John Freeman and Robert McFarlane and Rebecca Solnit and others and Deborah um, very much involved. It was a, uh, that was actually a bit of a global uh, program because Robert McFarlane's over in the UK. And then last fall, um, Deborah was in Seattle with John Freeman and did an evening, um, which was largely uh, the spirit of Barry's work. Um, John having poetry about Barry and um, Deborah piece in a, in a Freeman's about about Barry. Anyway, that just to say a little about um, the, the the life and legacy that's continuing to be um, shown in such ways for of Barry Lopez's work, and he, of course, underlies he and his work underlie all that we're doing here tonight. Um, I also want to mention that um, besides the Sheldon, which is involved with um, this happening tonight, and the, and the Barry Lopez Foundation, um, Terrain.org um, is a co co presenter, and um, our good friends at. Point Ray's bookstore, um, Stephen Sparks, they would have been a little more directly involved, but I think they have a new member of the family to to, to um, tend to, so they're not as um, visibly a part of this, but they in, um, have been very committed to Barry's work and um, working with some of the others involved here as well. So um, I will shortly turn this now over to, to Toby, who will say more, who will um, introduce the program, it will um, talk with Deborah, and then call on the photographers, Virginia Ban, Terry Evans, David Hansen, Mark Klett, and Laura McPhee, who are, who are joining us from all over the United States. And um, as you have questions, which we hope you will, um, comments, of course, in the chat, but in the Q&A portal, which is usually on the bottom, uh, if you could put a question there, um, Toby will work those in, um, either answer himself or Deborah, or direct them to wherever they will go to. Uh, I will come back at the very end to wish everyone a good night and thank everyone. But um, with that, I think I've said my little piece and I'm delighted now to turn this over to the very capable and knowing hands of Toby Jurvik. So thank you all very much. And Toby, take it take it away. Well, thank you. Um, I wanna thank everybody uh, for attending this uh, event in celebration of From Here to the Horizon photographs in honor of Barry Lopez. Uh, and of course, thank the Elliott Bay Book Company for hosting us this evening, and along with terrain.org and Point Reyes Books. I'd also like to thank our partners at the Sheldon Museum of Art at the University of Nebraska, which is now the permanent home of the home ground collection in honor of Barry Lopez. So every photograph, photograph that you see in the catalog um, now lives at the Sheldon. Um, and it will be on view there until May 26, and it gets a little summer vacation and comes back again from August 11th to through December 21st. So if you find yourself passing through Lincoln um, during that time, I hope you'll come in and uh, stop in and see the show. Um, and since we're coming to you from Seattle, at least virtually, um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, our partners at Mark One Books who produced this beautiful catalog along with it. We, we couldn't have done it without them. I'm very grateful. Um, most importantly, I want to acknowledge the photographers whose work appears in From Here to the Horizon. Um, every work in this book was a gift. Um, 50 letters went out asking people to contribute to a collection for Barry, and nobody said no. 
Um, the result, I think, uh, to borrow from uh, Robert Adams, who a, was a friend of Barry's and I think a friend of many of the artists in the book, he said, it's really a book by a bunch of friends that have joined together to honor another friend. So I'm very grateful to everybody who participated in this. Um, so why are we celebrating Barry Lopez with the photography book? I received a very concerned email uh, from a friend of Barry's who said, you do know he's a writer, don't you? Um, <laughs> and uh, I think the easiest answer is that from the time of the publication of Home Ground, uh, which Barry edited with Deborah Gordney, he'd hoped to create a kind of visual companion to that reader's dictionary and one that would pair entries from Home Ground with work by American photographers. So, you know, phrases like meander, swell, and sawtooth that we're going to see in today's presentation, as well as some of the more foreboding sites of the Anthropocene, like Tailings Pond and, and Strip Mine. And I think the goal was really to create um, a kind of call and response of words and images. Um, I think many of you know that Barry began his career working as both a writer and a photographer. Uh, he has an essay, Learning to See, which appeared in About This Life, where he wrote about both his affinity for photography and his decision to put the camera down um, in 1981. And he was talking about working in the Beaufort Sea uh, with several marine biologists. And he described following a polar bear in this small open boat. And um, you know, the polar bear was sort of getting up on the ice floe and back in the water and up on the ice floe. And he said, you know, when they returned to the research ship, he retreated to his cabin uh, to recall the details of this encounter as best he could. And that's where he recognized the kind of competing pull of these two activities of writer and photographer. And he said, attending to the camera during our time with the bear had altered and shrunk my memory. I sensed I'd never pick up a camera again. Um, I think this was really less a, an indictment of photography, but this acknowledgement that we can really only give 100% of our attention to one thing at a time. And he continued, to get, though I no longer photograph, I've maintained a connection with photographers and I keep a sort of running conversation with several of them. And I think what he, what he recognized was a kind of similar intensity of observation and also uh, a shared sense of moral and ethical responsibility to the landscape. And it's, it's really easy to see how his sort of bright, sharp attention to detail in his writing could kind of be considered as a form of photographic precision. Um, in, in the introduction uh, uh, to this book, which was written by Robert McFarland also, he wrote, I, I just love this phrase, of Barry's glittering mica-like prose poetry. And I think you get that sense of kind of clarity and transparency from it. Um, and I think that, you know, in reading Barry's work, we've all had that sense of being able to kind of close our eyes and visualize a place that we've never been. Um, you know, if you were deposited by a helicopter on the edge of the, you know, edge of the Arctic Ocean, it's like you could you know, quickly take your bearings and know exactly where you were as if you'd seen a photograph of that very same place. Um, you know, I think this conversation also was, it was a two-way street. Um, and many years ago, um, uh, I was giving a talk and a photography student had asked my opinion about a, a particularly turgid article that they had been assigned to read and were kind of shocked to hear that I hadn't read it myself. And they said, you know, why not? I said, well, I read what photographers read. I said, well, what is that? And you know, without hesitation and without really thinking, I said, Barry Lopez. Um, and I was, I was reminded of this two decades later, as the collection began to take shape um, in an email that I received from Virginia Bean. She wrote, Barry's writing has been a major influence for me. I carried Arctic Dreams around for years, sharing passages and ideas from it with anybody who would listen. What impressed me so much about Barry's writing and Arctic Dreams in particular was the slow moving attention to detail. I felt like he was with me using his version of a view camera or I was with him as he studied and thought about and tried to make sense of the world. I think as Virginia observes, his use of language feels very familiar to artists who are used to studying kind of every edge and every corner of a ground glass or the viewfinder before finally depressing 
that shutter and making the exposure. Um, in the introduction to home ground, Barry wrote, we put a geometry to the land, back country, front range, high desert, and pick our patterns in it, pool and riffle, swale and rise, basin and range. It is a language that keeps us from sliding off into abstract space. I think that Barry's language is not just precise, but visual. And I, I believe that he saw photography as a kind of partner in this endeavor. Um, he also wrote in Home Ground, quote, that this seemingly unfettered, nearly immeasurable American landscape I had become acquainted with had distinctly stamped a long line of American literature. Uh, to which I'd like to add this passage from the photographer Gregory Conniff. And he wrote, American space, American light, the things of this country come together to form a voice that shapes how we think and feel, much as our parents' voices shaped us during childhood. Uh, last month when I was at the Sheldon, someone came up to me and they said, you know, this is beyond being a kind of homage to Barry, this is this exhibition is really kind of an homage to, to the American landscape. And uh, you know, that's um, you know, was kind of built in from the beginning, but to put a finer point on it, the exhibition and the catalog are really about this conversation between the camera and the American landscape that's been going on for the last 150 years. And it's something we, we tried to make explicitly clear through the image we selected for the cover, um, which Mark Klett will talk about shortly, but there it is. It's a photograph called My Camera at the Head of Sinbad. And you can see Mark's view camera set up. And, and to me, it sort of reminds me of this tourist who's you know, inching as close as he can get to the edge so he can get the best possible, uh, best possible view. And Barry often wrote about what he called the factual testimony of the land. That's something that photography is particularly adept at capturing. And you know, it was really out in the landscape west of the Missouri River in the late 19th century that American photography discovered its character and kind of learning to speak with a, a clarity and precision that reflected both the boldness of our geography, as well as a kind of sense of elegance and lyricism, even in places that you know, some people might consider to be kind of ordinary or unremarkable. And in that way, um, this show is to some degree retrospective as it brings us back to that earliest definition of how our photography came to be. Um, over the last 50 or so years, uh, the photography's primary concern has been with the built environment and the camera was sort of off roaming in you know, the suburbs and highways and looking what I would say had been done to the landscape rather than looking at the land itself. And from here to the horizon really returns us to look, I think, affectionately at the terrain and the landforms that first inspired our love of the places that we now call home. So with that, Thank you, and I'm going to pass this along to Deborah Quartney, who will talk about how she and Barry brought home ground to life. Thanks, Toby. Um, my goodness, it's it's just such a pleasure to be here. I'm I'm the outlier, and um, really glad to be in your company. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's joined in tonight. And um, I'm so eager to hear from these five incredible photographers. So I'll just babble a little while, but I wanted to to uh, also just say thank you and uh, Toby thanked um, everybody thanks Kate and Rick for putting this on and everybody else who's um, Sheldon and and the press and um, the photographers who just so generously contributed work to this amazing book um, and but Toby uh, mostly I just want to say thank you to you you and Barry sat down and and had a vision for this years ago and talked about it and uh you brought it to fruition, and I, I can tell you he'd be thrilled with, with what's happening here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Okay. Um, I, you know, Barry, as Toby talked about, Barry did have years of being, before I knew him, he was, uh, he tried his hand at professional photography. And so Toby suggested that I maybe dig out some of his equipment. So I, I hope you can see it here. I, I just uh, put all of it, some of his old cameras and, um, 
that he just took care of and had tucked away when when he died we found them in his can you see them a little bit we, yeah. we found them up in the attic um the whole complicated uh, cleaning out after the death but um anyway it was lovely to, to have them here and 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 i i'm eager to give them to the foundation for whatever reason you want um i i think as um, many of you are aware Barry uh, Barry thrived with collaboration he he sought it out it fed him it fed his work he loved collaborating particularly with artists from other disciplines so um, and in fact uh, Jim Warren wrote this wonderful book called Other Country about how Barry had this impulse to collaborate and all the wondrous things that came out of that so it it was it's natural that even in the very first days of talking about what this monster project was going to be called home ground he was talking about a visual element and he wanted it to be photography and uh, you know that he had this idea of this book and it we had a lot to sort through but the first thing he did was uh put a huge map of the united states on our dining room table and then we started saying, what do we do from here? How do we make this, this thing happen? And um, so we just started sketching and planning and drawing and thinking and making all kinds of plans, but always with this idea that eventually it would be a, a collaboration with photographers. And so I know he'd be so pleased to see what all of you have come up with in this. And I know he'd be asking us to stand in front of these photographs and and see how they call to us because what he what both of us really wanted out of this book was that there there would be an evocation of these land forms and water forms and not an explanation of them and he he would say over and over again that this was not something that was going to be exhaustive we weren't, we weren't going to try to get to the very end of what a kiss tank was but just to open a portal that the reader could step into. And I see how these wonderful photographs are doing the same. And I, I, I know that's where Barry would want us to connect with them. Um, he, he spoke, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I heard him speak many, many times, hundreds of times probably. And he often, I don't remember a single talk where he didn't address the idea of intimacy. It was if if that was a theme, if there's a if there's one theme of Barry Lopez's work, it would be that it's intimacy, and how do we how are we intimate with each other, with our communities, and and um, and with our places? It was very essential to him that we find intimacy in our place, and so I I think that's what he would draw out of this project that you've all put together and, and I know that's what happened with with home ground when we were working on it for those years he wanted us when well, he wanted every one of these terms to reach out and touch the reader in a, in a way that felt like they could gain some intimacy with their place um, I, I remember that he was he was unhappy with a couple of the uh, the offerings of uh, on ice terms. He just didn't think that they went far enough that they didn't do that thing of reaching out and finding the reader. And so he said he was gonna try to work on them a bit. So he went to the library and he came back with, I think 12 or 13 books on ice. And I said, you've gotta be kidding. I mean, we're on a deadline here. And um, he sat down and read every single one of those books. And then he went back to this 250 word description of ice with, with the, the, all that knowledge in his mind. And I realized, oh, that's what we're doing here. We are, we're taking this volume of information and we're compacting it into these beautiful little vignettes. Um, and it, it was just an, an amazing project that has extended now to all of you. And I so appreciate that. Uh, I just wanna say just a couple of words about the book um, and, and the, some of the many, many reasons that I'm glad it exists. Um, the first one is that, uh, that I got to work on it with Barry for four years and um, that, that we had this project together and we learned a lot about each other through it. Um, not always pleasant, but it was um, just a, a great experience for me. And, and also that so many readers have come to the two of us or to, to 
him or to me and said that 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 the book has sparked an awareness in them that they didn't even know was there about their own places and the places they traveled to it's um to see people's excitement about this book has just been fabulous and also we got to work with 45 amazing writers who brought um such a insight and magic to these terms just like I was just talking about they evoked something so unexpected and beautiful instead of trying to explain and um, also a very dedicated group of advisors who uh, made sure that what we put out in the world was accurate very grateful for that but I think uh, for me when I was was considering this today that one of the reasons that I'm very glad that this book exists is so Barry could write that introduction um, I read it not, I read it recently and I, I was just knocked over by how relevant it is. It's, it's every bit as relevant in this moment as it was nearly 20 years ago. And I just, um, I just wanna say to those out, of you out there, if, if you haven't read the introduction, you're just gonna be stunned at how he cast into the future and was telling us something that we need to know right now. And um, if, if you have read it, maybe it's worth reading again. So that's it for me. I really appreciate it. And, um, and Home Ground is such a special book and now you've made it even more wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So we're gonna turn this over to the photographers here and um, Virginia, we're gonna, we said we're gonna go ahead and inventively do this alphabetically. Okay, thank you, Toby. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And um, I wanted to thank you um, again for this beautiful exhibition and book. I'm honored to have been invited to participate in this project. Arctic Dreams was my introduction to Barry's writing, and it was instrumental in my development as a landscape photographer. The questions he posed then are still alive for me today. How do people imagine the landscape they find themselves in? How does the land shape the imaginations of the people who dwell in it? How does desire itself, the desire to comprehend, shape knowledge? As a photographer, I'm concerned with the narratives that are revealed through careful observation and experience of place. Whether home or far away, it is these stories that bind us to the land and celebrate the fullness of human experience. I view my photographs much like a literary text with sentences and chapters that accrue and cohere over time. They combine to examine the long view of geology and history, human excesses, as well as creativity and inventiveness, and the idea of reading landscape. How do we enter new places and gradually learn to understand what lies before us? This photograph is from the current body of work entitled Elegy for an Ancient Sea, which is an exploration of the Colorado desert and its massive lake, the Salton Sea, formed by an engineering accident. 17 Palms Oasis is situated in the Borrego Badlands, a desert pounded by relentless sun and soaring summer temperatures. The journey on trails originally forged by indigenous people make real the harrowing passages of migrants traveling west and the fragility of life in this inhospitable terrain where knowledge of water sources is essential for survival. Also known as Prospector's Post Office, this was a well-known stopping place where travelers left messages tied to glass bottles of water hidden in the shade. In home ground, Gretel Ehrlich writes that Oasis is life. It is a gathering point, a sanctuary, and a feeding station. It is the desert's umbilical. Um, next slide. <clears throat> I am attracted to contested landscapes, areas where multiple human needs and desires clash and compete for primacy, sites where nature itself exerts raw power and influence. These, ge these geothermal hot, pots, hot springs were formerly underwater. With ongoing drought conditions and escalating demand for water among the populous communities of San Diego, the Salton Sea is shrinking, exposing toxic deposits and active steam vents along the unstable San Andreas fault line. 
in from here to the horizon, we place this photograph in relation to the term sulfatara, meaning steam vent or fumarole. But perhaps Joy Williams' piece about geothermal fields is more accurate. And I quote, these reservoirs of the Earth's heat lie several miles below the surface in areas of geologically recent volcanic activity. She continues, many in the mining industry contend that the exploitation of geothermal fields would provide clean energy, but fail to fully address the ecological problems, not the least being radioactive contamination of rivers and streams. Long presumed to become a dead sea of sorts, this area, in fact, is home to 11 geothermal electrical generating stations, and a new 12th station, appropriately named Hell's Kitchen, is under construction. In addition, geothermal water contains lithium, think rechargeable batteries for electric vehicles and grid storage, and the race is on to discover a cost-effective way to extract it from the brine, thereby reducing our dependence on lithium from China. Next slide. The Colorado River and its watershed is the major source of water for many Western states, but developers in the early part of the 20th century sought to turn desert into productive farmland by digging ditches. According to Home Ground, a waterway dug out by human labor to serve a specific purpose. Channels, an insistent flow of water that can be controlled or natural, and canals, a man-made water course constructed for navigation drainage or irrigation. Well, they dug 16,000 miles of them to irrigate the Imperial Valley of Southern California. This photograph is a view of the naturally south flowing river turning north, a place where the force of water is being driven toward fields of alfalfa, soybeans, carrots, and livestock feedlots. Here, it's no longer the Colorado River, it's called the All-American Canal. Next slide. <clears throat> this image is of cactus cultivation in desert soil. Of soil, Barry writes vividly, erosion, volcanic eruption, earthquakes, floods, tectonic grinding, landslides, and other natural forces. Sounds like California, doesn't it? Um, act continuously on the Earth's crustal rock, creating various types of debris, gravel deposits, mud flats in the tidal estuaries of creeks, cobble terraces, and beaches of black lava. Barry continues with more detail and patience. When chemical agents such as phosphorus and nitrogen infuse this debris and biological entities, including microbes and earthworms, work material into it organic enough to support plants, it becomes soil. But then he goes further to make an important differentiation. A soil that is chemically or organically exhausted, that's been pulverized or become deeply parched, that has been invaded by decomposing rock, or that's been fouled by sewage or industrial pollution to the point where it cannot support plant life, is called dirt. One is inclined to ask, is this what we are doing to the planet? Having been an English major in college, I still love to revel in the use of language, in the meanings, nuances, and complexity of words, and to experience how that language serves a deeper understanding of who we are and what we do. With home ground as inspiration, the photographs of From Here to the Horizon become a joyful, meditative, thought-provoking celebration of Barry's long commitment to this endeavor. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Terry, you're up. First, I want to say thank you to Deborah. I was so thrilled when Home Ground was first published. It seemed like something I had been needing for a very long time. Um, this this view of the Platte River was uh, is an aerial photograph I made of the Platte River in Nebraska in 1990. And what I really love about it is the way the water sort of braids around the small islands of trees. And I want to read you a quote from Barry about 
the river that he loves so much. It's very different from this Platte River. Um, it's another river. And this is from a book called Syntax of the River about the McKenzie River below his home. The more you watch the river, the more you understand what it means to apply the adjective alive. He goes on to say, um, I think for any writer, the place itself is not that important. It's your intimacy with the place. As, as Deborah mentioned earlier, it's your intimacy with the place that really is important. You can learn about God anywhere is what it comes down to. You just have to pay attention. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a train going through the Flint Hills of Kansas, uh, just north of the tiny town of Matfield Green. And uh, for some reason, um, Barry's words about intimacy make me think of this picture as a connection between the people of Matfield Green and, uh, and this Kansas Flint Hills, this, this open prairie that is mainly uh, ranch land. And, and the train is in fact going through it, but, uh, but it somehow symbolizes for me um, that connection. Uh, next slide, please. So I was on a Zoom panel recently in which when asked my thoughts about beauty, I said, I never release my shutter unless I think what is in front of my lens is beautiful. And apparently this image was on the screen when I said that. And Toby has called me out on this. Um, Toby said, you know, could you just please explain yourself? <laughs> And so uh, this picture shows petroleum coke, which is an extremely dirty byproduct of oil refining, dirty energy that's not even allowed to be used in many parts of this country. And this aerial view shows it being stored on the banks of the Calumet River in a thriving Latinx neighborhood where pet coke blew into people's yards, it blew into their homes and it blew into their lungs. I joined a local grassroots group fighting to get this Coke Industries storage site removed. And, and it eventually through the activist hard work that this did happen. Uh, we used my pictures as one of many strategies to influence change. And I have to say, I, I like this picture a lot. Um, it's a beautiful picture of hell. This, this is not a landscape that I want to have intimacy with. Uh, it's not the kind of beauty that I want intimacy with, um, but the picture had a far different purpose. Next slide. And um, this is a place that I do have an intimacy with. Um, this is a hay meadow on some land that is entrusted to my husband and me. And um, I've known this land for, I think uh, 58 years. And every time I see it, I've, I learned something new about it. And we don't live there now, we live in Chicago. This is in central Kansas, but we return there often. And uh, it's a place that reveals itself to me in so many ways. And in this picture, for example, I doubt you can see it on your screens, but uh, there are two deer. Um, there's a frog in this uh, little pothole in the bottom left-hand corner of the picture. Um, there are many prairie plants, even though it's, uh, it's land that has been planted and replanted. Uh, it's now uh, an open hay meadow. Um, so again, I want to, to turn to some words from Barry Lopez. And this is from a little book called uh, Crow and Weasel, published in 1990. 
It's the story of two friends, Crow and Weasel, who are making a journey across the Northern Plains. They're almost at the end and they're exhausted and starving. Grizzly Bear finds them and feeds them and tells them a story of a time when he was starving and how seeing a beautiful flock of geese gave him strength to go on. Sometimes it is what is beautiful that carries you, said Weasel weakly from his bed. Yes, it can carry you to the end, but it is your relationship to what is beautiful, not the beautiful thing itself that carries you, said Grizzly Bear. And I think, you know, that is, that is surely what Barry, Lopez was talking about um, when he speaks of intimacy. It is this connection we form to a place and that's the connection I feel to, to this land right here. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I first saw Full Strip, Montana in June of 1982 although it was located just 90 miles from my hometown. It was the site of one of the biggest coal strip mines in North America and the largest power plant west of the Mississippi. I learned later that the coal strip plant was ranked as one of the dirtiest in the country and its toxic waste ponds had poisoned the city's wells, sickened town residents and were increasingly contaminating the surrounding ranch land. A week later, I returned to photograph there, beginning what would become an intensive study over the next three years. There was something about Coal Strip that touched me deeply. Dramatic changes were occurring in the place where I'd grown up and to which I felt deeply connected. Here was a contemporary American landscape linked inexorably to some of our culture's central issues and conflicts the relationship of humans to the natural world, energy production, environmental degradation, and climate change. This series was the beginning of my investigation into the late 20th century American landscape as it reflects our culture and how we live now. I soon began to make aerial photographs of the coal strip site to communicate the vast scale of its operations and because so much of it was off limits. I was also interested in how my ground views and aerial views offered two contrasting perspectives on this place. Next slide. This is the Yankee Doodle Tailings Pond in Butte, Montana, another mining site that I documented extensively. As I was photographing at Coal Strip, I conceived of a project that would begin to describe how much our country's landscape had changed over the past 150 years. I wanted to show that this environmental destruction was taking place all across America. Consequently, I widened my scope to include all of Montana and the High Plains, eventually encompassing the entire country in an examination of the American industrial and military landscape at the end of the 20th century. While I was working on my coal strip project, I also created the series Minuteman Missile Sites, aerial views of nuclear missile silos throughout Montana and the region. Next slide. This is the poisoned an abandoned town of Times Beach, Missouri. In 1985, I received a Guggenheim Fellowship to undertake Wasteland, my extended investigation of Superfund hazardous waste sites throughout the United States. To contextualize my aerial views of these toxic waste sites, I developed a triptych structure, juxtaposing three different forms of representation for each place. My aerial photograph was flanked on either side by a topographic map indicating the site within its surrounding environment and an EPA site description detailing the history of the site and its hazards. Next slide. 
This is a clear cut in the Kootenai River Valley in Northwest Montana. Several years later, I created the Treasure State, my series documenting commercial and industrial sites throughout Montana and their impacts on imperiled wildlife. The framed pieces in this series feature the Latin and common names of the affected species etched onto the glass in front of my aerial photograph. My subsequent mixed media installations addressed North Carolina industries and endangered species, Dogway Proving Ground in Utah, and US nuclear tests. These and my other works became my meditations on a ravaged landscape. Finally, as a way of putting my photographs more directly in service of the issues that they were addressing, since the late 1980s, I have worked with regional and national environmental organizations on mining reform, hazardous waste, and energy production and climate change. For example, we met with many members of Congress to discuss environmental legislation, including the revision of the antiquated mining law of 1872, the renewal of the Endangered Species Act, and Superfund. Then in 1998, Montana became the only state in the country to ban the highly toxic cyanide heap leach gold mining process. And three years ago, half of the coal strip plant was permanently shut down with the rest of it scheduled to close in 2025. On a global scale, these are tiny steps of progress in the face of overwhelming odds to try to create the sustainable planet that Barry Lopez envisioned and wrote about so beautifully. And as he counseled in his final book, to embrace fearlessly the burning world. I'm deeply grateful to be a part of this collection in honor of him. Thank you, David. Yeah. Mark. Um, thanks, Toby, and thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in this and also to you, this picture on the cover uh, of the book. Um, it was so a picture. It's called, you know, my camera at the head of Sinbad uh, in the San Rafael Swell. And I was actually honored in the book that Terry Tempest Williams wrote the the the, uh, um, the words for that because uh, I greatly admire her and and uh, and her work. Uh, but the thing was, I was taking this picture on a on a trip where I was scouting, and a lot of my pictures were made just just trying to discover this place that I lived in since 1982, um, you know, what it was like and what I was finding. And it was one of several pictures I made in an attempt to kind of bring the bring attention to the act of making an image. Uh, that is the act of looking and the mechanics of making the photograph itself. And I can't, I have to tell you, I can't actually remember <laughs> if this was my camera, which is what the title says, or it belonged to my colleague, uh, Jim Baker, who was the head of Anderson Ranch then. He had exactly the same camera and tripod, so I can't remember which one is which. But I think the, it, the imports is this the same. Uh, it was the act of sort of making, the consciousness of making a photograph is often overlooked, uh, the act of, of actually making something that's impactful. Uh, can you advance a slide for me, please? And then this one also in the book too, um, drinking from a pothole uh, downstream from Hack Canyon or uranium mine. And um, this is this was done on an Anderson Ranch workshop too, where where the, we didn't trust the springs either; they weren't running, or we were afraid that it was, they were getting radiation from the Hack Canyon uranium mine, so we drank out of the potholes that were filled with rainwater instead. Um, and this, I don't know if I'm holding this up, but you can see this now. This is the cover of a Harper's uh, magazine from July 2000, in which they used that a strip of that image. And the, the title, the, the lead story was called Running Dry, What Happens When the World No Longer Has Enough Fresh Water by Jacques Leslie. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that we're still asking the same question today. 
Um, and in spite of the great amount of precipitation we've had this last winter in the, in the West, uh, it's not going to go away. Um, now, Toby, you asked me if I would talk a little bit about the statement that I put in the book, which was a reminiscent of meeting Barry Lopez for the first time. And I met Barry uh, in May of 1989 uh, at a memorial just north uh, and inside of Arches National Park for the writer Edward Abbey, in which Barry was one of the people invited to speak. And he had just a few years before that won the National Book Award. So he was getting a lot of press. Uh, he came, as I remember right, I think he was wearing a tie actually. And this is way out in the middle of, of the uh, uh, Slick Rock there. And he gave a very fiery speech uh, honoring Ed Abbey and kind of skewering the machine. I, I had to listen, I have a recording of this speech actually. I had listened to it again the other day and uh, it was pretty, insightful and, and something that I I think affected me in certain ways. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this was a picture I made uh, not very long after that, um, really just a matter of a couple of weeks. And uh, I have to um, credit and thank my friend, uh, Linda Connor, who's, this is, I think she's on the attendees list here. This was her camera. And she great. I'm grateful that she let me use it. And that's her hand, and that's her best West, Western watch band that she's got in the picture. Um, but it's it's sort of similar to the first picture, the one of the San Rafael Swell, in but it's a different version of the same idea, uh, which is it's about photography and about how we need to look or what photography does and how we look as photographers. And I think shortly after I went to the Abbey Memorial and met Barry, I was thinking a lot about how photographs have shaped the iconography of the West and how photographs have sort of taught us to see. Uh, and then as photographers, how we use our tools to affect other people and, and then in consequence, how they see the landscape because of what we see. Uh, and um, so I think in, in retrospect, knowing Barry's work better in the kind of craftsmanship that he used um, and the, the, the precision in which he used the language. And that in some ways, this was uh, my understanding of the, that as photographers, we're doing the same thing or we need to do the same thing. First of all, that we need to acknowledge our presence and, and what we do in using the tools that we do to craft the messages that, that we create. And this choice of making this particular picture at Monument Valley was, was very purposeful because that is a place, Monument Valley, that is known throughout the world, starting with you know movies and stuff back in the 1930s. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, then I'm sorry, this is a little bit self-serving in some ways, but I wanted to show this because uh, this was um, an event that I attended at the Muse Houston Museum of Fine Arts in 2006, in which Barry and I were both speakers. And we then later signed books. And you can see us here, we've got our books in front of us. And he's got a copy of Home Ground, which was just released pretty recently after, or before this uh, event. And we, we both you know, signed the, the books on this. But I, I wanted to tell a little, another story that occurred, and this was kind of, piggybacking on what Toby said in the beginning about the origin of, of uh, from here to the horizon. And also Deborah mentioned it too. When we met uh, this for the second time and years later, and we talked about our respective projects and books, um, Barry asked me about the idea of doing a, a book like Home Ground, but was based on photography which I thought was a great idea. And I, you know, I thought this should really be done. He asked me if I would be interested in getting involved in it. And I said, absolutely, but I'm not the guy who you need to you know, try to put this all together. Uh, I recommended that he contact a curator and I gave him several names, but I, I think one of the names was Sandy Phillips at, at uh, San Francisco MoMA. Uh, then fast forward, a few years, well, quite a few years later, um, they did in fact uh, produce a book, uh, Radius Books uh, published it a few years ago called American Geography. 
And it's a very fine book, and I don't mean to take away from that book, um, but I would say that the conversation I had with Barry about the idea of pairing uh, photographs with descriptions of landscape is ultimately what exactly what From Here to the Horizon does. And so my feeling is that eventually the book that he and I talked about at least got done. And I'm very proud to be a part of it. And congratulations to everyone that was involved. And, uh, and it's just really wonderful for me to sort of see this come full circle uh, later on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Laura, you want to uh, wrap us up this evening? All right. Thank you, Toby and Deborah and everyone involved in this project, because it is really such an honor to be part of it. So thank you. Um, I think about Barry Lopez and some of the same quotes that Virginia read at the beginning, how do people imagine the landscapes they find themselves in? And I, I think as this picture pertains to that, it has to do with, for me, and it, it, I often reflect on that quote because it I found myself in this new landscape. It was a, um, in 2003, I was offered an artist's residency in Idaho and I am from New Jersey and I am very much tied to the East Coast. Although over the last 20 years, I have brought as, as Barry writes, we bring our own worlds to bear in foreign landscapes in order to clarify them for ourselves. And that has been a tremendous process for me. Um, when I went to Idaho, I had been working in a city of 15 million people in Kolkata, India, and I found myself here in this place with its altitude, its emptiness, its sawtooths, which is the word from home ground that um, pertains here. I really hesitated before accepting this um, residency because I felt unequal to what would, would uh, what I would find in front of me, which was this place. And this was the view from where I was living. So, and I came to think about how this landscape was divided and how it had been used and how it um, now had this fence and it demarking public land and private land, how water was being redirected, how many things were going on in what otherwise seems like an empty landscape. Next slide, please. There, I, I had to develop a whole new lexicon, a whole new understanding of land management, of what the, the ways that people defined landscape and um, actually lived in it. I love that um, Toby re referred to the factual testimony of the land because that is what is so alive in um, photography. This was about a devastating forest fire that was started by a man burning a box in a burn barrel, 43,000 acres burned. Um, and I'm very interested also in the unintended consequences of actions, but also of land management. So we have not allowed forest fires to occur. And so there's so much fuel on the ground that it becomes a problem when, when somebody makes a mistake, a rather massive mistake. Go ahead, next slide. This is the other picture from home ground and the word is talus, which is sometimes you can also use the word scree, which is all the um, debris that flows downhill at a sharp angle. It's a geological term. 
And I love this cowboy who's up here perched in the rocks with he who's an angel, who's become an angel. Next slide, please. Again, it's the, the way we imagine the landscapes we find ourselves in. My actually my great grandmother was a teacher in the West who worked in, she was an itinerant school teacher in Montana, Washington, Nevada. And I think of her when, I, when I'm making this picture and when I'm making many pictures actually across the West. Um, because the, this is what the schoolhouses that she would have taught in are now like this, semi-abandoned, but also alive in their environment. Thank you, Toby. Well, I want to thank thank all of you for uh, participating tonight. And um, as I said at the at the beginning, um, this project you know happened because fifty people uh, were generous enough to create this create this collection. And um, you know that was the you did all the hard work on this, so I I really appreciate that very much. And I I thought I would um, I thought I'd close with a um, a question for uh, for the five of you. Um, so I was I've been thinking about this. I, I reread Arctic Dreams um, last year. And this was published in, in uh, 1986, and there was no mention of um, human-caused climate change in that book. And I think James Hansen's uh, climate report came out two years later. And then in 2006, when Home Ground came out, um, you know, it was remarkable how much had changed and our awareness had changed in that 20-year period. Um, and Moving ahead 14 years, um, Barry's last essay was uh, published online on December 24th, 2020. It was the day before he passed away and it was published in LitHub and it was called An Era of Emergencies is Upon Us and We Cannot Look Away. And uh, this uh, essay actually ended up in American Geography, the, the book that Mark mentioned that was put together by our friend Sandy Phillips at SFMOMA. And in that Barry wrote, he said, as I write these words, I'm compelled to say that I see no sign of such salvation on the horizon. This is not to imply that the situation in the United States is hopeless, but only to suggest that we have been kidding ourselves about there being just up ahead, a clear path to the other side of this. So, um, I would say that that within the very short span of all of our lives, we've witnessed this tremendous kind of tipping point uh, in how we understand understand the planet, understand the landscape. And I guess what I would ask you is, how do you find hope, or where do you find that um, in your work? I keep that essay on my desktop and partly it's not um it's not that hopeful right i mean we we're we're in a moment where we're really grappling with the idea that we have 10 years to do something so it um i think as we make work we think about how the world um, or at least I should speak for myself, I think about how the world will persist with or without us. And so that, to me, that, that gives me a lot of faith, actually, and, and it, it is heartening. Anybody else? <laughs> Well, I agree with Laura, as we often do about many things, um, that uh, 
I don't feel that hopeful. I actually think that um, politicians and the average person are not really wanting to be uncomfortable to the extent that would be required to make, to turn this, uh, the Titanic around. And, um, but I, I think that your question taps into ultimately something deeply spiritual or religious for me. And that is, um, what do we think will become of us? And so to feel that, uh, that the world will become much more unstable. We already are seeing these terrible weather patterns. I'm not, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not hearing that people who live in those places of relentless tornadoes, of flooding, of these chronic storms, uh, fires, mudslides, I'm not hearing the alarm bell ringing. Um, that somehow people we, we talk about the cost or the tragedy, but are people really ready to um, galvanize to take action? I'm not really seeing it yet. I, I, I do hope that something will happen, um, but uh, so far there are not really solid signs of us joining together as a nation or as a world to make the changes that that are required of us um i would it's a difficult thing for me to try to wrap my head around in some ways i i've been fortunate enough to work with people who are much better at expressing themselves in words than I could ever do. And so one of those people is I've worked with, collaborated with Rebecca Solnit, who's got a lot more to say about hope than I could ever uh, try to say. But I mean, so she describes hope as an, an embrace of the unknown. And she also, I mean, and I'm probably gonna get this wrong a little bit, but hope is not the assumption that everything's gonna work out right. Like, I just hope it's gonna be okay. I mean, you've gotta do things. Um, and so it's a call for action in a lot of ways. I think where it gets interesting for me as a photographer is that what are the ways in which we call to action? And I, I'm not a particularly good person and good photographer at like being um, a kind of just, you know, activist in the sense that my pictures are documenting those things. Other people do that much better than I do. But I kind of feel like just the act of looking and the act of paying attention and the act of um, even describing things that are incredibly beautiful can be also ways of achieving that. I think there's many different routes to getting there. And one of the things that isn't good is just to sort of give in to despair about something. So, you know, I, I think that there is a call for action and we can't turn away as the, the essay that Barry Lopez wrote says, but there's many ways that we can turn to it um, and embrace it, I guess. I find hope in a growing relationship with land itself, uh, particularly with the place I showed you the picture of, um, and deepening my own sense of understanding of what the earth has to say to us. And uh, I find it, I find hope also in my grandchildren, even though I worry a great deal about them because uh, they will be going through some very rough times, rougher than and I will. Um, but it, I think, in fact, I think it's, it's more like what Mark said. I think in this uh, deepening attention to the earth, to the places that we're trying to understand through our photography, um, it, it has to count for something because I, I remember reading something by Thomas Merton once, the uh, um, 
Trappist monk, and he said, uh, there, are, there are two monks praying somewhere, and they're, they're what's holding the whole thing together. And so that suggests to me that when we keep trying to see as carefully and as deeply as possible that it matters, As I said earlier, the odds are so overwhelming against uh, the kinds of changes that need to be made um, in order for us to sort of reverse course uh, on a planetary level. And increasingly in this country, um, it seems like we have more and more of a dysfunctional government, Congress, and even state governments. So um, I'm, I've sort of been thinking that hope is really more kind of, it's like the old um, sort of saying, think globally, act locally. And uh, so I am inspired by some of the people that I've worked with in environmental organizations in Montana and in the Pacific Northwest and um, some of the things that they've been able to accomplish. Um, again, sort of small steps in the direction of uh, making a change. Um, but, uh, uh, and I also feel like raising public awareness is critical and um, art can play a role in that. Yeah. Um when we first established the foundation, somebody asked me rather pointedly, well, you know, how is art gonna stop climate change? And um, the answer very directly was, well, it's not. Um, but thinking about, uh, David, what you just said and, and something that you touched on, Mark, that, that what art does is it points to what we should care about. It draws attention to what we should care about. And, um, you know, in one of these books behind me, John Sarkowski says, and what the camera does is point at things and say, look at this. And I think that that's how all artists work. And I think what we really hoped ultimately would be um, sort of the end result of, of this project is that people would look at this catalog or would look at home ground and either find the things that they were familiar with or find places they would would you know never been but want to go um, because of one of your photographs or because of an entry that somebody had written, and that is through things like this that that really remind us what we care about and what's most important. So, uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, in the audience for coming tonight. Thank all of our sponsors and thank the five of you for for joining us. Good Toby, evening, Toby. I think we all. Um, oh, a deep um, feeling of gratitude and respect uh, for what you've accomplished with the foundation, with the collection, with this exhibition and installation, with the catalog. It's, um, as I've told you in several emails, I know at times it's been a kind of uh, Sisyphean task, but um, it's remarkable what, what you've done in honor, well, of, in honor it's, of it's thank you. It's not you know. Uh, I appreciate it. It's really not about about me. It was about wanting to uh, to do something that you know. As, as Mark talked, I mean, Barry and I first talked about this in two thousand and six, mm -hmm. and um, I think I somewhere in the in the acknowledgments I said you know what this proves is that good ideas can be very stubborn things. So. Um, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to, to give Barry a copy of the book myself, but um, I have a feeling he's probably seen it. Um, and so it was really about being able to bring this, uh, to, you know, bring this, bring this together uh, for him. So thank you. And again, for us, all of us, um, to say, uh, as, as was just said of you, Toby, but to all five of the, for Virginia and Terry, David, Mark and Laura, um, beautiful to see the work and to hear you 
and you, Toby, for the, your words and also all you've done, and to Deborah, um, who not only here tonight, um, but also with this this part of this, but also um, for having helped make the um, home ground, you know, in, in ha happen, and and for so much else. And again, to everyone else who's come from afar, I know Adrian Lucia, um, who's part of the making of the book, is here too. So we've been watching. So. Um, and you, I don't know if you were there earlier, Adrian, but um, words were said about the beautiful work of the book here, which um, was here in Seattle, done in here in Seattle. So again, thank you, everyone. And um, from here to the horizon um, is at Elliott Bay. It's at, um, it's also at Point Reyes and other stores, but um, please get it online or get it, come, come in and get it um, and read it and see it. And if you get to Lincoln, see the exhibit at the Sheldon. Um, so thank you all again, wherever you are. Take care. Thanks. Good night.